Hello, everyone. I'm Gustavo Drecki. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about the work that we do, trying to understand um, uh, suicide and risk factors for suicide. So the way we uh, understand suicide today, contemporarily, is that individuals who die by suicide have, on one end, a given predisposition that uh, is given by factors that act, as we say, it, um, uh, more distally, temporally, than the suicide event. On the other hand, we have factors that act more approximately uh, to the suicide event and act as precipitants. All of these factors are important, but what I would like to um, discuss with you it's, uh, today is about the role of early life adversity, uh, which is um, something that uh, I have uh, spent my career trying to understand how is that early life adversity or uh, history of uh, uh, childhood uh, sexual and physical abuse as well as uh, um, psychological neglect uh, can increase um, the uh, risk factor, can increase risk for suicide through a lifetime. Now, let me be clear is that most of the individuals who die by suicide do not have a history of early life adversity, but a significant minority does. So the key question to me um, over the years has been, how can maltreatment uh, during childhood influence uh, suicide risk over a lifetime? So what happens that increases or that explains this increased risk? So in order to have some insight into this question, we have uh, drawn work uh, initially um, looking at cohorts that are representative of the general population. Um, so for instance, you know, studies looking at children um, and then following them up over the years. Uh, what these uh, uh, studies have shown to us is that um, the way that early life adversity can increase risk uh, um, uh, of suicide is by leading to differential development of uh, personality traits and emotions. And in, particularly, in particular, what these studies have shown is that um, there are uh, um, personality traits, such as impulsive aggressive traits, and as well as emotions like anxiety that seem to uh, play an important role in explaining this increased risk of individuals who were exposed to a life adversity. Now, the other key question is how can adversity during uh, childhood lead to this differential development of personality traits? In other words, what happens uh, that as a result of that negative experience, early on in life, uh, these individuals would have uh, this increased likelihood of becoming more impulsive aggressive and having more anxiety traits. So the way to understand this question is to think that our brain is an organ that it's, as we call it, plastic. So what does plastic mean? It means that it adapts. It adapts with experience. So the brain actually learns with experience. And this is a key feature of the brain. Now, its capacity to learn with experience, although it's present for life, is not the same for life. There are periods in life in which our brain is more capable, more uh, open to adapt to experience. And we call these periods as critical periods. Typically, critical periods in brain development are during childhood. Yes? So, a number of brain functions are differentially regulated, yes, through these critical periods. So there are intuitive brain functions, like for instance, language acquisition, where our brain is more capable and perfectly capable of learning languages early on in life. And then as we mature and become older, even though we're able to do so, the capacity decreases. So for instance, I don't have to tell you that English is not my uh, native uh, language, um, because even though I can communicate in English, hopefully so, I uh, have an accent that I will always carry. 
Yes, so I don't speak English perfectly. So what we've learned as well is that there are these critical peers, in other words, in childhood, not only functions like language, but other key uh, functions of our brain, including social fun functions and, our, and the capacity of the brain to regulate behavior yes, and emotions. Um, it's also um, uh, regulated early on in life in these critical peers. And how does that happen? at the molecular level is through mechanisms, in large part, that we collectively refer to as epigenetic mechanisms. So what are epigenetic mechanisms? Um, so these are a collection of processes um, that um, basically adjust the way our genome functions. So think about our genome as a collection of genes, and epigenetics is basically um, represent mechanisms such as methylation, uh, histone modifications, or non-coding RNA. So these mechanisms act somewhat like if you think, for instance, as a switch, as a light switch, yes, that it's, uh, that you can, that it has a dimer. So the one, the epigenetic mechanisms would be like a, a switch with a dimer. So what they do the epigenetic mechanism uh, uh, processes, what they do is they control, either they turn on or off a gene, and they control as well the amount of uh, that this gene uh, um, uh, functions, yes? So there are key processes in the regulation of our genome, and as such, they're very, very important, and they are um, processes that uh, are dynamic. They occur um, they are regulated lower life. Now, we, we understand that epigenetic processes play a key role in the regulation of brain, brain processes primarily during these critical periods. So the hypothesis of our studies is that these traits that I told you that are important in explaining the relationship between our life experience and adversity and increased risk, uh, uh, risk such as um, differential um, impulsivity and aggression and anxiety are regulated through these epigenetic processes as a result of this negative experience in life. So how can we study this? So to study this, we, have, we need access to brain tissue and I have been fortunate to have uh, access to uh, the um, brain tissue by having access to the Douglas Bay, uh, Bell Canada Brain Bank, which is a brain bank that collects tissue from individuals who died by suicide as well as individuals who died from other causes. And then um, uh, not only has these, the tissue, but has also the histories of individuals uh, that donated the tissue. So we have a lot of information about the development of these individuals and as well as a number of other um, information that are important to do the study. So the first study that we did almost you know, more than 10 years ago was a study looking at a, a gene that is known as the glucocorticoid receptor gene. So, and we did, and we looked at a region of the brain known as the hippocampus. So we compared individuals who died by suicide with histories of uh, early life adversity and with individuals who died by suicide without those histories and controls. And what we observed was that individuals who died by suicide with histories of early life adversity had uh, differences in um, methylation, which is one of these epigenetic processes, in a key part of this gene. And in such a way that these individuals that had increased uh, methylation then had a decreased amount of the gene, you know, in the hippocampus. So here you have a scheme on your right, you have what um, individuals of early life adversity that die by suicide. On your left, you have normal development. So individuals, for instance, that um, did not have history of early life adversity and did not die by suicide. So individuals who had the history of early life adversity and die by suicide had increased uh, methylation and therefore decreased a, a, a smaller quantity of the receptor in their hippocampus. And why is that important? Because um, this is connected to an uh, axis that we know as the axis, that is an axis of our body that controls how we 
um, react to stress. So when we are under a stressful situation, this axis is activated and releases a hormone known as cortisol. So when cortisol is released, it goes back here to the hippocampus and gives a signal um, to the hippocampus to stop activating the axis. So we call this a negative uh, feedback. And uh, so typically in a normal situation, cortisol is released by this stress axis, comes back here, and then suppresses the activity of the axis. What we think happens in individuals who were exposed to life adversity and diverse suicide is that um, because they have less quantity of this glucocorticoid receptor in the hippocampus, they are less efficient at um, uh, suppressing the activity of the HB axis. And as a result, they have an overactive, yes, or hyperactive axis. And why would that be the case? So we think this is an adaptive mechanism. It's a way that the brain adapts to a situation where there is a presence of uh, childhood abuse, yes? And why so? It's because, you know, we have to understand that an individual who is exposed to adversity, to abuse, is not constantly exposed to adversity. So it is sometimes and sometimes it's not. Typically, this, uh, the abuse comes from uh, uh, um, primary care providers. And often, uh, this is in the context of intoxication. So the brain sort of gets a message that the environment is not predictable. Sometimes the uh, person who is providing primary care, it's, you know, it, it's nurturing and sometimes it's not, it's abusive. So it adapts by increasing the levels of alertness. And, um, and so it's basically as if it would be constantly wired to pay attention to where danger will come. So as a result, this constant state of being wired, yes, it translates as being more anxious. So we think that this is a possible mechanism that would explain why is that these individuals who were exposed to a life adversity would develop as a result increased anxiety traits that then in turn would increase risk of suicide. So this is one example. Certainly it's not the whole story, but it provides you one example of how is that this may be the case. So now let me give you an example for the other relationship, which is um, a study that we did looking at uh, in between the genes that code for monoamine oxidase A and monoamine oxidase B. So these are the genes that are, are already known, you know, monoamine oxidase A, known to be involved somewhat with uh, aggressive behavior. And what we found was that in individuals who died by suicide, uh, with histories of the first, we had differential epigenetic regulation in between these two genes. And this dif di uh, differential epigenetic regulation was basically in um, controlling a, a transcript known as malin, that we baptize as malin because it stands for monoamine oxidase A associated long intergenic non-coding RNA. So this, what basically means is the, it, it's, it's a big molecule that it's produced here in a region here that it's in between these two genes. And in fact, this molecule here regulates, controls the activity of this other gene, monoamine oxidase. So what um, then, what we did, you know, in collaboration with Eric Nestler's lab at Mount Sinai, we did, you know, experiments in mice where we um, tested, you know, we um, uh, injected in the mice um, with viral vectors, this big molecule that we identified um, that it's differentially, you know, I, I, I didn't tell you this big molecule is differentially expressed. So there are different quantities in the brains of individuals who were exposed to a lack of adversity and die by suicide. So we uh, um, uh, injected with viruses this molecule in the brain of mice and then observed their behavior. Because uh, I think this video will be more illustrative to tell you what actually we found, I'm going to I'm going to show it to you. Basically, the uh, mice here, the white mice were injected with the virus. So there are two mice that had the virus with this long molecule, and then two mice that had the virus without this long molecule, they were empty. Yet. 
And so what we did is that we um, introduced in their cages these other mice here, the, the black mice, that were just in, introduced into the cage and then we observed how they interact. So normally mice would interact. They would uh, interact with each other. Mice are social animals. And then occasionally they would uh, fight. Uh, but you would see that there's a marked difference between the groups. I'm not going to tell you which one is which. Uh, I will just let you guess. So, um, Okay, so clear that these two here were the ones with this big molecule and they were more uh, sort of uh, uh, active into aggressing the other mice and then were also more impulsive in doing so. So if the video would continue function, you would see that the other mice as well would, would attack, but not as frequently, not as quickly as the other ones. So this is an example we take of a molecular process that could explain why people who are exposed to adversity have an increased likelihood of developing um, impulsive aggressive traits. Yes? So, in summary, what I told you is that individuals who um, were exposed to a life adversity, they are um, more likely to have epigenetic changes in key um, uh, genes. Some of these epigenetic changes occur as an uh, adaptive mechanism. Uh, we think that you know, most of them do. And that these epigenetic changes then would lead to changes in how these genes, uh, the genes uh, function. These changes in, in gene function would uh, then lead to uh, changes in how behavior and emotions are regulated. Yet. So for instance, I gave you the example of impulsive aggressive traits and anxiety. And then this also associate with other changes like cognitive changes that we won't have time today to, uh, to talk. Now, what we think is that these changes associate then with impair regulation, yes, of emotional and cognitive response. So this is sort of a background that by itself would not explain why these individuals are uh, more at risk of dying by suicide. What happened is that at one point, um, uh, these individuals will become depressed, and with depression um, comes suicidal ideation. And we think that with, uh, w when these individuals are depressed with suicidal ideation, they are more likely to act on the suicidal thoughts because of this background here, and for, you know, particularly because of the um, increased impulsive aggressive traits and the anxiety. So as I told you, these seem to be like mediators. They seem to explain the relationship between early life adversity and suicidal behavior. So that this would lead to this, which in turn, and certain conditions like these ones would lead to an increased risk of suicidal behavior. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, of course, this work is work is a result of several years of studies. A, a lot of people involved. These are uh, the people from my own uh, group that have been involved. Um, and then there's as well, of course, collaboration with a number of other labs uh, around the world. So thank you very much.